Hi, everyone. This is Todd Rosenbluth. I'm the head of ETF and mutual fund research at CFRA. Thanks for joining us. We're going to talk about the biggest and biggest winners and losers during the ETF boom. CFRA did an exclusive five-year look back at the successes and failures, and it came up with a number of key takeaways. I want to join my colleagues here by welcoming you. Uh, and as you'll see here on the screen, uh, I'm joined on this webinar by Anakit Alal, who heads up the fund data and analytics of CFRA as part of an acquisition we'll talk to you more about. He came over from First Bridge, and he and I have known each other for a long time within the ETF industry. And Kathy Seifert is here with us as well. Kathy Seifert covers asset management companies as well as other financial services stocks from the stocks perspective of CFRA. So I'm excited that they're both here as we walk through the webinar. On this next slide here, I'll just talk to you about the agenda that we're going to walk through. I'm going to remind you a little bit about CFRA. I know we've got some new folks here that are joining us. We'll then talk to you about the overall research project that CFRA put together using the first bridge data, our key findings. Then we'll have more of a conversation. And Kathy will join us here about the challenges and opportunities for asset management companies under her coverage. And then at that time, we'll take your questions. I'd encourage you to use the chat box that you see on the screen on the right-hand side so that you can be able to submit questions now, and we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. Now I'll talk to you a bit about who CFRA is. So for those of you that are less familiar, uh, we are an independent research provider uh, focused on stocks, on ETFs, and mutual funds. We also do uh, rigorous sector and industry analysis. A lot of that work is done from a forensic accounting perspective, uh, focused on the quality of a company's earnings, and then we match that with valuation assessments to provide research tools and opinions and recommendations for our clients. But most important to us is independence. And so what we do uh, is not manage any money or make trades. All we're doing is investment research and recommendations that's different than some other firms that are offering research and recommendations that do actually manage money uh, separately. And so we think that's a real differentiator for CFRA. That independent research is key to the way that we do analysis of mutual funds and ETFs. We rate those separately, and we do with a more forward-looking approach than our competition. We're able to do that because we're leveraging a team of stock analysts, Kathy being one of them, uh, that focuses on the equity and accounting perspective of the individual companies. We'll use that analysis to drive a rating on ETFs and or mutual funds from a valuation and risk perspective. And then we've been doing this a long time, incorporating costs. I know others are starting to include costs in more of their backward-looking or analytical ratings. We've been including cost metrics such as expense ratio and bid-ask spread for a long time. But what I'm really excited about is we've just made an acquisition of, of, of First Bridge Data. Anakit, I want you to take over here since that this was your company that we brought into the fold and talk to, you, talk to the audience about how how this fits in with the research we've put together. Thanks, Todd. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, we're, we're back. Hopefully, you can hear us as well. We're going to transition back to the slide. And, Anakit, I want you to kick off again about the acquisition CFRA made of First Bridge data. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, as Todd mentioned, uh, first which was a, a specialized provider of ETF data and analytics, and we were acquired by CFRA a couple of months ago in August 2019. This is quite an exciting development for us because it allowed us to combine uh, first bridge's ETF data with CFRA's existing world-class research. So really that combination of data and, and research for ETFs is quite exciting. And this paper is really the first step in the integration of those capabilities we expect down the road that we'll have a lot more research as well as products that combine first bridges ETF data along with CFRA's uh, ETF research. So moving on to the next slide, we essentially what we did in the study is we really took a long-term look at ETF success and failures. Uh, if we look at a lot of the articles and commentary on ETFs, a lot of that tends to be short-term focused on flows or performance, and that's certainly valuable. Uh, because it's timely, 
But what we wanted to do with this study is really take advantage of our ETF database and look at how ETFs have performed over the last five years. And specifically, what we did is we took the ETF universe that existed as of year end 2014, so just a little under five years ago, and looked at how that cohort or group of ETFs performed to date. And the, the important thing here is that we didn't start with today's universe because that would include, that would essentially um, bias our data by not including ETFs that closed in the interim period. So the key thing here was to be able to take the cohort or set of ETFs that existed in December 2014 and then track that entire universe over this four and a half, five year period and see how ETFs performed. That really gave us insights into the long-term factors driving ETF asset gathering success. So as we analyze the data, we found five key trends which we summarized in this report and this presentation. And I'm going to quickly touch on each of them and then we'll dive into each one of them. The first thing we found is what we termed a winner take most concentration effect. In other words, a small number of ETFs accounted for a very large percentage of the net flows in this five-year period. Now, for those of us who track the fund space, we already know this intuitively, but being able to see the actual numbers and see how dramatic this effect is, is actually quite interesting. The second trend we noticed and we analyzed and is related to the first one is that two firms significantly dominated net new flows. Those two firms are BlackRock and Vanguard, it's not a big surprise. But the interesting subplot of that story is that many other asset managers also grew. So even though two firms dominated, there was plenty of growth to go around for the other asset managers who had success in this field. The third trend is that for those ETFs that provided what we sometimes call smart beta or strategy exposure, we found that macro, the macroeconomic environment or macro timing was a very significant factor in driving asset gathering success or failure. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. Uh, the fourth trend is we looked at uh, closures for ETFs, and we actually found that exchange traded notes accounted for a very large share of closures. So we look at closures in a little more detail. And finally, we also found that 30 ETFs from our starting universe had objective changes. In other words, the underlying index which they tracked changed and also the index exposure, the type of exposure or strategy or asset class that the index was giving exposure to also changed. And in the ETF space, we think this is an important thing to, to track, just like we track style drift in the active management space. So these are some of the five key trends that we um, summarized in our paper. And just moving on to the next slide, essentially what we've done here is this summarizes what we did in this study. And what we did is we took the entire universe of 1,662 ETFs that existed five years ago, which is at the year end 2014, and classified them into five buckets. So we said the first two buckets were growth related. So we said if a fund grew more than 20% annually in terms of assets, we classified it as rapid growth. If it grew at a stable rate between zero and 20% annually, we classified it as stable growth. Similarly, we created categories for slow decline and then rapid decline, which is declines of more than 20% annually in assets. And the fifth category, which is an important one, is closures. <clears throat> so those ETFs that actually closed in this five-year period. Now, what's interesting is that even though the set of ETFs we tracked grew in aggregate assets by almost 90%, it's interesting to note that the outcomes for individual ETFs really span the entire gamut. So 25% of the ETFs had rapid growth, 21% had, had stable growth, and almost a quarter, 24%, closed down. So it's very important to look at the details under the hood and see what happened to specific ETFs rather than just the aggregate ETF universe. Now Todd will move on to describing the first trend, which is the winner take most concentration effect. Thanks, Anakid. So on the on the prior slide, Anakid showed that about a quarter of the universe uh, experienced what we defined as rapid ETF growth, but it's a much more concentrated effort of where the assets went to. So there's the old 80-20 rule that people tend to uh, think about, but the 20 in that 80-20 rule tends to be the 20% that gets 80% of what of the overall assets. 
what we found here is actually just 20 ETFs in total, roughly 1% of the overall coverage universe that we had in our data accounted for 44% of the asset growth. And if you look at just the top 100 ETFs in terms of asset gathering, which is 6% of that universe, they had more than eight out of every $10 went to those products, more than 80 or 83% very concentrated and as we as we'll touch on on upcoming slides you'll see that it was as mentioned earlier blackrock and and vanguard that got a good chunk of it but there's specific assets and specific etfs that really were quite popular so let's move to the next slide here and talk about two different trends we're going to focus one on the s p 500 and then we're going to broaden it out to some other large etfs of from five years ago so sticking here on the S&P 500 based ETFs, there are three of them. One from iShares, one from Vanguard, and one from State Street Global Advisors that track the S&P 500 market cap weighted index. So the returns for these three ETFs are nearly identical because the underlying holdings are identical and it's just a question of whether they allow for dividend reinvestment and how well they track the index. But we noticed that there was a significant difference in the asset growth in, since 2014. Specifically, IVV and VOO were significantly faster growers than SPY. VU, VOO, is actually the fastest of the growers, 38% annualized growth in the, during that four plus year time period. IVV's 20% growth is again very strong. SPY actually had outflows despite the fact that it continued to go up. And we think that there was a couple of things. One is the expense ratio plays a meaningful role. So IVV is cheaper than SPY, and VU is actually now cheaper than IVV. The expense ratio uh, was even lowered to three basis points. SPY, for perspective, is nine basis points. And you can see the market share shift uh, in color coding towards the top half of the screen. Uh, where you can see that IVV and VO really took market share from SPY, but despite the fact that there were significant outflows, SPY is still a dominant ETF. It is still the largest, most liquid, most frequently traded of the ETFs around, and for good reason. Uh, it's, it's significant market share in the S&P 500 overall marketplace. On the next slide here, we wanted to not only include SPY and IVV and VOO, but also just show you what has changed in the last four and a half years uh, between the, the league tables. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the, the 20 largest ETFs based on assets under management uh, at the end of 2014. The right-hand side is the assets under management for the car or the more current, the end of August, ETFs top 20 products. And you can see there is some consistency. We do see ETFs that are towards the top half of the top 20, thus the top 10, uh, on the left side and on the right-hand side. But there are also some notable changes overall. So I want to point to a couple of them on this slide, and then we're going to go more in-depth on a few others on upcoming slides. So VEA, which is a Vanguard Developed Markets ETF, was towards the bottom uh, of the... 2014 numbers, and so to give you perspective, it had $24.155 billion in assets. You can find it on, on the screen yourself. If we move to the end, to end of August of 2019, this was a more than $70 billion ETF, so it, it nearly uh, tripled in size. That wasn't necessarily the result of developed, developed markets shining, as it was investors embracing this low-cost, well-diversified product from Vanguard. Second ETF, if you found VEA beforehand, just below it is AGG, which is the iShares uh, core aggregate bond ETF that is now tracking the Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Index. It used to be the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index. And AGG was a $23.3 billion ETF at the end of 2014. It was now or is now a $66 billion uh, ETF at the end of August of 2019. Bond ETFs in particular have really exploded in the last couple of years in terms of the asset growth. Uh, this year in particular, we've seen more than half the assets go to fixed income ETFs like AGG and others that are out there. 
despite the fact that it is 20% of the overall universe. The flip side, of course, happens is that if we're going to see some ETFs climb the league tables, there's going to be ETFs that either drop off of the top 20 or that, that move their way down. And so I want to highlight one that moved its way down, IWM. Let's go back if we can for a second, please. IWM is, uh, was a $30 billion ETF. This is an iShares uh, Russell 2000 ETF, broadly diversified, but a small cap oriented ETF. The assets grew only to $40 billion. So it was the 19th largest ETF overall. IWM was at $40 billion. Uh, and that happened because we saw some other small cap oriented ETFs that are cheaper available from iShares and Vanguard and others that took some market share. Now let's move here to the next slide and, and just give you a couple of examples of ETFs that either Climb the league table, or that actually uh, joined it uh, after being in focus from a low cost perspective. And so IEFA and IEMG are two such examples offered by BlackRock iShares. iShares a few years ago launched the Core Series, which is basically a low cost version of some of their more established products. They track different indices, there are nuanced differences between them. In the case of IEFA, it has some more small and mid-cap exposure versus EFA, so there's no I in front of the older, more established product. In the case of IEMG, it also has some more small and mid-cap exposure in contrast to EEM. Uh, IEFA in particular, as we're highlighting on the screen, had $62 billion of inflows during the four and a half year time period that we studied costs just seven basis points. That's considerably cheaper than EFA. Not surprisingly, EFA fell down the league table. And that's really an example of how BlackRock iShares, as well as Vanguard, uh, started to dominate uh, in, in more recent years. Anakit, I'll move you to the next slide here and let you take over. Thanks, Todd. So in, in trend one, we talked about the winner take most concentration effect at the fund level. In trend two, we're really looking at it at the fund manager level or the fund sponsors. And we see a similar trend here where if we look at product success or asset gathering success over the measurement period, two firms are really dominated. In fact, 18 of the 20 fastest growing ETFs are from these two firms, Vanguard or BlackRock. And if we look at the top 100, over 60% are from these two firms. So Clearly, BlackRock and Vanguard have had a lot of success in asset gathering in this measurement period. The interesting thing is that it's not just these two firms that have grown. Because there's been a rising tide in ETF asset growth, that's benefited a whole range of fund managers. And we summarize this in the table here. So if you look at, these are the top 10 fund managers at the beginning of our measurement period. So at the end of December 2014. And if you look at the outcomes for all of, the, all of them, They've all had a range of outcomes. So BlackRock, for example, has had 31% of their ETFs had rapid growth, but conversely had 23% with slow decline. Similarly, State Street has also had a mix of uh, growth and declines, and we see that across the board. So in other words, there are two stories here. The first story is Vanguard and BlackRock have clearly dominated asset gathering. However, the second story is because there's been a rising tide all of these top 10 asset managers have had significant successes in various products. The interesting exceptions here are Vanguard, where if you look at Vanguard's outcomes, 98% of their ETFs have either had stable or rapid growth. So that's been the only asset manager that's had no closures along with First Trust. So Vanguard and First Trust are the only two fund managers in our universe here that have not closed any ETFs during the measurement period. Moving on to the next slide, we actually did a little bit of a deep dive with three asset managers. And what we did is, the first one is BlackRock. And what we did is we took the top 10 ETFs as of the beginning of our measurement period and looked at the outcomes for those top 10 ETFs. Not surprisingly, BlackRock has had a lot of success. Uh, IBV has shown rapid growth, as has ADG and so on. Other ETFs have had stable growth. But there have been some cases where ETFs have had slow declines. And as Todd mentioned, this is because BlackRock has essentially cannibalized some of its own products with lower cost alternatives. And so we see a range of outcomes, but some of them because of this longer term trend of assets going towards low cost, broad based 
um, ETFs. Moving on to the next slide. We did a similar analysis for Wisdom Tree, and these were the top 10 Wisdom Tree ETFs as of December end in 2014. And this is much more of a mixed picture here because Wisdom Tree's asset ETFs, unlike iShares, are much more strategy oriented. For example, a lot of the ETFs are currency hedged, or they provide uh, their non-market cap weighted, and so on, or they may be more targeted, such as dividend ETFs. And therefore, they're much more uh, susceptible to the, the outcomes are much more dependent on the overall macro environment or the overall economic environment. As we'll discuss later, Todd's going when we talk about trend three, certain macro trends, such as, for example, the strength or weakness in the US dollar significantly affected the outcome of many of Wisdom Tree's ETFs, and we see this being more true of smart beta ETFs in general. Moving on to the next slide, the third asset manager we took a deeper dive look at was Invesco. And again, we see a range of outcomes here. Again, these are the top 10 ETFs for Invesco as of the beginning of our measurement period. And we see a range of outcomes ranging from stable growth to some decline. Again, the more well-known ETFs that provide broader exposure or where ETFs have kind of, where investors have kind of chosen that ETF for a particular strategy, let's say QQQ or SPLV that are low cost, those have grown. But others that are much more targeted, for example, let's say commodities or buyback strategies, some of those have had uh, declines. And so as we look at these three asset managers, we can see some of our trends kind of shining through. One is the shift towards low-cost ETFs. The second is ETF outcomes being driven by more macroeconomic factors. And this is evident in the look, kind of detailed look at these top three uh, fund managers. Todd will now take a, a deeper look at trend three. Thanks, Anakid. So you touched on both uh, Wisdom Tree and Invesco, and we're going to use them uh, as examples tied to macro timing and, and smart beta. So your, the first trend that we highlighted uh, talked about low-cost, broadly diversified products gaining significant market share, but we've also seen more nuanced products. The, what we in the broader industry refer to as smart beta, which is essentially non-market cap weighted, uh, so companies make it into the ETF based on specific criteria that's not just the price or the market capitalization, uh, but certain characteristics such as uh, lower volatility or dividends or exposure to a certain market. Uh, currency hedging uh, would certainly fit into that as well. And what we found is that we can see more of a boom and bust mentality for certain strategies depending upon macroeconomic factors. And we can also see that when the market becomes volatile, uh, as we've increasingly seen in the last year or so, investors will rotate towards using certain individual products to be able to do that. And so the, there's more volatility, pun unintended, in terms of uh, the asset growth uh, with these products as opposed to the broadly diversified, low-cost core products. So let's give you a couple of examples on this. So the first one is we're going to focus on is currency hedge international ETFs. And you would have seen this on the prior slide that Annika did tied to Wisdom Tree, uh, but there are two larger or two of their larger products at the end of 2014 were currency hedged international ETFs. Wisdom Tree Japan hedged is DXJ. Uh, Wisdom Tree Europe hedged is HEDJ. And you can see how the assets spiked up in 2015 for those respective products and then have fallen considerably sharply since then. These two products uh, are designed to take the currency exposure out of international investing. So you reduce the volatility that you'd get from a, uh, a weaker yen or a weaker euro, um, and you'd also, but you'd still have equity exposure to those respective markets. Uh, what we showed here on the screen is where, and specifically it's relevant for DXJ, which is in the darker blue, is how those at the asset base compared to a iShares Japan product, EWJ, which is an unhedged version of the product. And you can see that what we've seen is, is significant stability in the iShares product up until the last year, and that had more to do with competitive pressure, we believe, 
from some lower cost alternative products uh, that offer non, uh, non-currency hedge alternatives. But I do want to highlight here is just, we don't show it on the screen, but I wanted to pull some more recent numbers that there's a belief that investors are, are chasing performance uh, with ETFs. That's something that they've historically done with mutual funds. But if we look over the last three years, DXJ, again, that's the currency hedge Japan product, is up 8% on an annualized basis over the last three years. EWJ, the unhedged version of Japan exposure, is up only 6.5%. So since I don't have it on the screen, let me just make that a little clearer. 150 basis points of outperformance for DXJ, but in the last three years, DXJ has seen more than 50% higher outflows. Investors have just rotated away from currency hedging, even though it is working, because they don't have confidence in that same macroeconomic theme. On the next slide here, I want to transition to where we have seen asset growth, but a, a bifurcation in where that's happened, and that's specifically with the low volatility assets. So we don't have the ticker, we have the tickers, but not the names. USMV is an iShares minimum volatility ETF. SPLV is an Invesco S&P 500 low volatility ETF. Back in 2014, SPLV was the larger of the two products. It was 5.3 billion versus 3.6 billion. If we fast forward to the to August 2019, the gap widened significantly. And you can see it, it really took place in the last couple of years, even though we saw an overtaking uh, in, in the initial uh, three-year period. USMV is, is now a greater than $30 billion ETF. SPLV is a stable grower. It should be, you know, Invesco should be happy that it's now a $12 billion ETF unless you compare it to USMV, which has seen much larger, much uh, stronger growth. Now, a couple of things to note. SPLV charges a slightly higher expense ratio, 25 basis points versus USMV's 15 basis points. And as if you followed any of the ETF research that we do here at CFRA, you'll notice that ETFs that sound the same are often not the same. USMV has more sector diversification. So for example, USMV has 9% in utilities and 16% in information technology, whereas SPLV has 6% in technology and 27% in utilities. So a big differential in that, the costs will play a role in investors' decisions, the diversification will play a role, the distribution efforts will play a role, but it is a reminder that there is not all ETFs are gaining the same investor attention and something that was popular in one period of time isn't necessarily going to be popular as we move forward. And again, I'm going to let you move us into trend number four. So in trend number four, we took a look at what I mentioned earlier, which is closures. And this is very critical in a study like this because we want to make sure we not only look at ETFs that grew, but also those that closed down to avoid any survivorship bias. Uh, one of the nice things about the first page database is we have in our database all the ETFs that have closed down. And so over this measurement period, almost 400, 399 ETFs actually closed down. And we noticed a couple of interesting trends. The first is that one third of these 400 closures were exchange traded notes. Now exchange traded notes technically are not fun. They're actually 33 act products and they're index tracking medium term notes issued by typically by bank. And so they're kind of a different product structure from a typical Act um, ETF. So it's quite clear from looking at the data that ETNs haven't always got the same traction as a product structure as more traditional ETFs. Uh, in fact, if you look at the top 10 closures in this period by assets, they were either ETNs or target maturity products that essentially died of natural causes where the maturity date was reached. So clearly this is an important trend uh, when we're looking at closures. Just moving on to the next slide, we can take a look at some of the other um, important closure themes. The first is that, um, you know, generally there's a consensus in the industry that reaching about $100 million in assets is essentially the threshold for achieving product viability. And a lot of the products that closed down had median assets of just about $10 million at the start of our measurement period. 
and really never failed to get the traction or the asset growth across that $100 million threshold into viability. So, in fact, almost 90%, 89% of these, of these funds never ever crossed $100 million in assets. That's one important theme. So obviously, um, you know, asset uh, being very small could be a concern, though of course it's important to look at other issues such as the underlying holdings, which we'll get to in a minute. The other themes we notice with uh, respect to closures is that a lot of the ETFs that closed down had very specialized international market exposure. This included Asian local debt exposure or you know very specialized uh, geographic exposure to a certain market like Eastern Europe or Chinese bonds and so on. And some of those ETFs kind of struggled to get traction or uh, when the macro timing was adverse, uh, were eventually shut down. Moving on to the next slide, um, when Todd and the CFRA research team uh, publish uh, research on ETFs, they keep very close track of closures because when a fund close, closes, investors may incur a, uh, you know, a taxable event that wasn't intended. So it's really something we track closely. And we don't use assets under management as a threshold for rating ETFs. In other words, we really try and look at what are the liquidity of the underlying holdings, what are the trading costs of that ETF, and some of these metrics actually provide better insight into an ETF's sustainability. And so therefore, we have to take a comprehensive look at all of these factors when we're analyzing closures. We're now gonna move on to the fifth trend, trend five, which is ETF objective changes. Now, when we look at um, in-fund analysis in an active mutual fund space, one of the things that we look at very closely is um, style drift. In other words, is an active manager straying from the benchmark or moving into asset classes that weren't part of their mandate? With ETFs, we've got to look at a whole different bunch of things, which is why having a database or research that's very ETF specific is, is quite important. So one of the things in the ETF space is seeing how the whether the underlying index for an ETF has changed, and if it has, has the underlying investment objective changed? This is critical because an investor who's invested in a particular ETF may suddenly find himself or herself in a completely different type of uh, fund um, without that fund ever having actually returned any assets to the investor. So uh, what we found is in our 1,662 ETFs that were in our track universe, 30 of them changed their investment objectives and some of them were quite significant. And which is why we believe that when we do uh, our research and our in ETF analysis, it's very important to look at the underlying holdings of the ETF rather than just relying on the past performance. Because if the underlying index is completely changed, the past performance of that ETF is not relevant anymore um, in analyzing that ETF. So in the next slide, we actually give some examples of ETF objective changes. And what we've done here is laid out a particular ticker, its old objective, and how that same ETF has gone to a new ticker and a new objective. So for example, PLTM, which was a platinum mining ETF, shifted and became an agricultural-based ETF. Uh, another ETF to provide exposure to copper mining stocks shifted more and broadened to natural resources. And some of the changes are quite dramatic. If you look at the next one, an investor in FTW, which was essentially providing exposure to Taiwanese stocks, it completely changed its benchmark and shifted into Indian stocks. So this is a case where an investor holding a particular ETF is essentially getting a completely new fund just because the fund manager has changed its underlying benchmark. And therefore, for an each fund firm uh, tracking ETF data or analyzing ETF data, being able to track and monitor these objective changes is very important. So those were our, um, some of our key trends. Todd will provide an example now of a specific ETF that had an objective change and then summarize some of our key findings. Thanks, Anakit. So I, I specifically want to highlight this ETF because the, not only the name change, that, but the, as you mentioned, the objective change, but want to just put some, some meat behind uh, the research that we have and how our holdings-based research can play a, a different role than some others that are out there. So as a reminder from that prior slide, this ETF used to be a China Dividend X Financials ETF. Uh, 
and now this uh, offered by Wisdom Tree. Now this is a Wisdom Tree China X state-owned enterprises, which is not necessarily the same thing. Uh, and, and as you can see here, the ETF uh, launched in, in 2012. About three years later, the objective change happened in the middle of 2015. What happens when an objective change occurs is the ETF uh, and the ETF provider gets to keep the track record, uh, even though there's been a, a new objective and a new approach to it. And as we do analysis on this ETF, which we cover today, we cover CXSE, uh, it's diversified across all of the sector or most of the sectors. So consumer discretionary and communication services were combined about half the portfolio, but 8% were in financial stocks. A reminder, there were no financial stocks. It was specifically excluded from the ETF uh, in, before 2015. Now it's nearly 10% of the overall portfolio. When we do analysis on the ETF, we find many of the stocks to be attractively valued on a forward-looking basis. I pulled this up on a competing uh, provider's public-facing website and saw that this ETF earned four stars for them tied to its long-term track record. Half of that track record is not tied to the overall investment objective. So take that for what it's worth. We believe investors should be looking forward when judging an ETF, not backward and holdings analysis plays an important role. Now I'm gonna summarize uh, what we've talked about here and set up the stage for what's ahead and before I bring Kathy uh, back into the conversation. So we've touched on five different themes. Uh, winner take most concentration where just a handful, uh, less than one or but roughly 1% saw of the ETFs gathered more than 40% of the inflows, 6% of the ETFs, uh, garnered more than 80% of the inflows. Vanguard and BlackRock were dominant, but we laid out examples of how we've seen growth at WisdomTree, at Invesco, as well as other asset managers. We talked about smart beta and currency hedge ETFs, uh, where the flows are not necessarily what you might expect if you looked at a point in time, uh, specifically a currency hedge and low volatility products. We talked about the closures. We tend to hear a lot in the news about there's ETFs are closing, and is that a sign that the industry is slowing down or facing maturity? A third of the ETFs that have closed in the last five years are ETNs. They are a different animal. And so we think you need to look at ETNs separately from ETFs and not lump them all together. And then we highlighted the importance of looking at whether an ETF changes not only its name uh, but it, and its ticker, but its objective. So that was what we put together using the data as of starting at the end of 2014. A lot has changed in the industry, and in some cases that have changed with, since we put together the initial report. Uh, so Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan have crashed the ETF party. Uh, they had one ETF combined in the marketplace at the end of 2014. JP Morgan is now a top 10 ETF provider. Goldman Sachs is GSLC. Uh, has a uh, is a seven billion dollar ETF that charges the same fee as uh, what you get from uh, the spy product. We now have rules that are be going into effect that show that give asset managers a level playing field in launching ETFs. So there's no grandfathering. It's a much more simplified process to launching ETFs. The SEC cannot in ETF rule. We think that should move some firms off of the sidelines that have not launched ETFs. We think that should help to spur this. Also helping to spur ETF uh, product development is the has been the approval of a non-transparent actively managed fund structure. Uh, we'll probably talk about that more in the Q&A portion of this, but this allows asset managers that don't want to show their uh, daily holdings, the ability to launch ETFs uh, as traditional ETFs. And we expect we're going to see the first of those products coming to market by the end of 2019. And we think that the growth is going to continue to, to not only impact you and your clients, but also the asset management industry overall. And with that, let me set Kathy up. As a reminder, Kathy Seaford has up the asset management stock coverage uh, for CFRA. Thanks, Kathy. Oh, thanks, Todd. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. Um, sure. Just to sort of frame the discussion a little bit, um, you know, our view on the asset management industry currently is a neutral fundamental outlook. 
Um, as the title of this slide implies, we view the ETF marketplace as a, both a challenge and an opportunity for, the, for asset managers. But our neutral stance on the industry reflects our view that secular challenges, including those um, that are manifesting themselves in outflows from actively managed products, are offsetting some of the favorable demographic trends, including changes in the retirement marketplace, and an aging population's need to save for retirement. Um, coupled with the growth opportunities from passive investments like ETFs. And then when we look at sort of companies in the industry, there are a couple of um, factors that we take a look at. One of the things that we think will be a very significant um, differentiating and bifurcating force within the asset management industry is technology, both from the way technology is used to offset um, the downward pressure on, um, on revenues and as a means to maintain margins by, by shifting to a lower cost uh, back office administration and fund administration, but also in the case of some companies that are monetizing their technology capabilities to basically create another competitive moat around their business model. And I'll discuss that later when we talk a little more about BlackRock. And as both Todd and Aniket have alluded to in their presentation, scale is a, is a core focus, particularly given the downward pressure on fees. And that as a result of that focus, we think the industry is ripe for consolidation, both the ETF industry and the broader asset management industry. The offset to that, though, is that investor response to a number of recent deals has really been mixed. Um, so with that, why don't we just look at some numbers to get a little perspective. Um, this slide illustrates a couple of things in terms of on the, the pie chart on the right, on the right shows, I'm sorry, on the left, it's flipped on my screen. On the left, we see regulated assets, the invested asset mix about a decade ago. And in that slide, we note that mutual funds dominated the industry with 93% of assets under management. Fast forward 10 years, and mutual funds are still a dominant force, but we can see the growth of ETFs, which now account for 16% or accounted for 16% of the industry's um, invested asset mix at the end of last year. And then over this 10-year period, what we saw was ETFs growing at a 10-year CAGR of 20%, versus mutual fund asset growth of about a third of that at 6.3%. Um, based on these trends, CFRA estimates that ETFs will account for nearly a quarter of the industry's asset mix by 2023. And this has significant um, implications and ramifications for the industry's revenue mix and margins. So if we look to the next slide, some of these trends are already playing out in fund flow trends among some of the top publicly traded asset management firms. And this, this is a good example of how the industry is being bifurcated by these trends. And so during 2018, fund flow trends were negative for most firms. Granted, we also had a, a, a correction in um, late in the year, which is also why I did full year results. Um, very few firms escaped this trend, but there are some notable exceptions here. Um, at the top of the heap is Eaton Vance, which is primarily still an active asset manager, but one that has a number of proprietary strategies, um, including its Calvert ESG um, asset management group. Um, and as a result of those proprietary strategies, Eaton Vance, ticker symbol EV, um, had positive fund flow uh, relative to AUM in what was a difficult year for the industry. At the other end of the spectrum, we see federated, primarily a long only active manager with almost 10% of net outflows. And then in between here, we see you know, BlackRock, the category killer in ETFs, um, showing positive fund inflows, as well as T Row. Um, another primarily active asset manager with a um, sort of a top tier stable of funds, good distribution, good platform, good fund performance, enable them to show positive growth. Um, Invesco, which we'll discuss in more detail later, 
is a top ETF provider, but Invesco still is fairly heavily exposed to a number of active um, equity strategies that continue to see outflows, the result of which um, was that last year Invesco saw nearly um, 3% outflows. And so just to drill down a little into some specific names and some actionable recommendations, First up is BlackRock. Um, as you all know, um, the largest ETF provider with over $2 million tied to iShares. But if we take a step back and look firm-wide, iShares only account for about 29% of their AUM. They still have a very sizable index fund business and an actively managed business. Um, we recently upgraded our opinion on BlackRock last week after they reported um, third quarter results that basically showed us that the combination of scale performance and diversification um, drive some fairly decent organic results. And third quarter, BlackRock posted organic asset under management growth of 5%, which we believe is probably going to be at the upper end of industry averages. Um, what paced that was some double-digit growth in iShares as BlackRock which um, my colleagues have alluded to, continues to, to gain traction despite the fact that they're at the top of this rather large heap. The other factor that's significant for BlackRock that I spoke about earlier was technology as a bifurcating force within this industry. One of the interesting things about BlackRock is their ability to monetize what was an internal system, Aladdin, which is a, a comprehensive asset management technology slash operating platform, um, is becoming a growing force in the asset management business um, and is a, an interesting competitive, competitive advantage for BlackRock as it seeks to basically find other other moats in the model. And um, last quarter, or this quarter, last week when they reported results, they posted a 30% rise in technology revenue. So this is a growing business for BlackRock and another way in which they continue to pivot and shift their strategy um, to, a, to a changing operating environment. And so with the next slide, we'll focus on another actionable name, and this is Invesco. Um, as my colleagues alluded to, Avesco, Invesco is a significant ETF provider, though the fourth largest, so they've got a significant share of the market with a little over $200 billion um, in Invesco branded ETFs. Um, they have made a number of um, acquisitions to bolster their presence in both the asset management and the ETF marketplace. Um, the issue, though, is that the marketplace was not particularly positive on their acquisition strategies. They have acquired um, Guggenheim's ETF business. Most recently, they acquired Oppenheimer funds. Um, they are also expanding their suite of ETFs, um, both through a non-parent, non-transparent active ETF and they will likely, we believe, expand their suite of um, bullet shares fixed income ETFs. The issue with Invesco is that um, they are still heavily weighted, uh, more than three quarters of their AUM is still heavily weighted toward active strategies that are continuing to see outflow. So we currently have a hold on shares of Invesco. The two primarily active managers that we have by recommendations are, are Eaton Vance and T. Rowe. And again, um, Eaton Vance has um, an asset mix that's heavily weighted with proprietary strategies, including um, exposure management and portfolio implementation strategies, as well as alternatives that account for almost half of Eaton Vance's AUM. We believe that those strategies have, have insulated Eaton Vance from some of the secular challenges that many of its peers are experiencing. Um, Eaton Vance um, has sort of acknowledged that they have not been a significant presence in the ETF marketplace. They had launched Next, Next Shares, which was a hybrid mutual fund ETF product in 2016. Admittedly, 
It hasn't gained a lot of traction. Quite frankly, that hasn't been the worst thing for the fortunes of Eaton Dance. Um, they are now expanding their presence with Clear Hedge, a non-transparent ETF. So I think one thing to watch at, ET at, at Eaton Vance in the next couple of years is going to see how they execute their ETF strategy. We do have a buy recommendation on these shares, though. And then finally, we have Tiro, um, again, another active asset manager with over a trillion in AUM. Um, heavily exposed to equity strategies and multi-asset um, because of scale, performance, and their platforms, they have produced um, performance numbers that have been above most peers and that have enabled T. Rowe to maintain an attractive moat and an attractive competitive position in the broader asset management industry. Like Eaton Vance, T. Rowe has also acknowledged that there is a threat to its existing model from passive investments, and they too have sort of been tiptoeing into the ETF space. Um, candidly, they probably should accelerate this strategy, and I think one thing, again, to watch at t -Row is how they execute their ETF strategy, which is probably going to come to greater fruition in the next couple, um, in the next few years. So thanks, Kathy, and thanks, Anakit. Uh, if you have not submitted questions in the chat box uh, and you have any questions, uh, please do so. Uh, I realize we're coming up on the hour, but we had technical difficulties, so we will take a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one of them, which I alluded to uh, briefly, but I'm glad it got asked the question, so I'll, I'll somewhat read it. Kathy, this would be towards you, and I'll add some color to this as well. Uh, throughout the presentation, we mentioned cheaper expense ratio products playing a role, but we also saw commission-free oriented ETFs see significant or see some asset growth in the last couple of years. And what do we think is going to, what role do we think that's going to play on both the ETF lineup that's out there and specifically to asset managers like BlackRock or Invesco that aren't available on all the platforms. So maybe I'll let you start there from the BlackRock and Invesco perspective. Sure. And I'll chime in. Sure. Maybe I'll take it up a notch as well and look at the macro picture. And, and it, you know, the decision by a number of the discount brokers to, to eliminate commissions, I think is basically going to force a revisiting of the broader value proposition in asset management and in wealth management. Obviously, two separate industries, two separate drivers. But as it relates to um, zero commissions on ETF. One of the things that we may see, and we may see more of this in some of the fixed income ETFs or some of the low volatility ETFs, is that there may be a greater acceptance of some of those ETFs because now trading them is, is commission free. They may supplant some money market funds and money market assets as um, short term um, sources of liquidity. I think that's one thing to look for in this trend. Um, yeah, and I, I would just add uh, to that, and I agree with you, uh, that I think we're going to see products that have high liquidity, where there's significant trading volume, uh, products like perhaps the you know iShares small cap ETF or the iShares Russell 2000 ETF or the triple Qs from Invesco or SPY that were not available commission-free, that investors will now look at total cost of ownership and now think about the trading costs and the bid ask spread of those respective products. So I do think we're going to see uh, the advantage for some of the larger, more liquid oriented ETFs. Uh, Anakit, a question for you. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Maybe you can talk just about the ETF data uh, that, that we now and CFRA will soon make available to our market scope advisor clients and that clients can get directly in terms of just level setting, in terms of how, how an ETF gets classified, how quickly an ETF gets classified, and how you guys and how the team tracks something like an index change. Sure, Todd. So when we think about ETF classifications, the important thing is we try to make sure we're not forcing every ETF into one box. Because what we found is that the way advisors and investors look for funds has changed. So earlier, if you look at some of the legacy frameworks, mutual fund frameworks, they were really designed to evaluate active fund managers, right? So it is really all about evaluating how a fund is done against a particular benchmark. Uh, 
Whereas what we're finding now is that advisors want to be able to find funds based on the macro environment. So they were looking for, let's say, funds that provide low volatility exposure or, let's say, short duration bonds, for example. And therefore, the way we've designed our classification is multidimensional. In other words, we want to capture all the aspects or all the elements of a fund's exposure so that advisors and investors can find it through any dimension. So, for example, let's say if you have a China technology momentum ETF, we would classify it as China exposure, we would classify it as technology, and we would classify it as momentum. In other words, it's tagged in all three dimensions. And so an advisor searching for China ETFs would find it, somebody looking for technology ETFs would find it, and momentum strategies would find it. So the key is, is to be able to tag an ETF on multiple dimensions, be able to find it in multiple ways through a screener and so on. So that's really the way we thought about our fund classification system and fund tagging system. In terms of time frames, we actually make sure that every time an ETF is launched, every single day we get into our database. So we try and minimize the time between an ETF launch or a closure and when it's updated in our database. We have a couple of analysts whose full-time job is to just track the ETF universe to make sure that you know every time an ETF either changes its index, changes its expense ratio, uh, launches or closes down, we capture it in our database. So that those are kind of the key principles that underlie the way we classify ETFs as well as capture some of the data. Thanks, Anakit. Uh, in the interest of time, I will do one more question. Um, and, and Kathy, you, you mentioned using T. Rowe Price uh, earlier about how quick, you know, how much they'll dip their toe in. Maybe we can just level set as to why do you think asset managers that have a large active management presence, why have they been hesitant to, to enter the ETF market? Well, I think in the case of T. Rowe, it hasn't been, you know, if we look at the margins in active asset management, they're certainly a lot um, wider than they are in um, passive. And for a company like T. Rowe that has, um, that already has a stable of well-performing products where there are inflows, there hasn't necessarily been a need. I think on a go-forward basis, as the marketplace has changed and evolved and investor preferences have changed and evolved, um, I think they're feeling that, you know, again, against this backdrop, it's a missing component of their business mix. And while they've certainly had top-tier performance, they're not immune to this trend. I, again, I, I agree with you on this, and I think we're going to see. So they have a filing out to, to launch ETFs. They actually just hired somebody from State Street Global Advisors to run the ETF business that doesn't yet exist right. uh, from any products. But obviously, that means that something is coming. And I think we're going to see other non-transparent products. So Gabelli has the filings to be able to enter. They don't have existing ETFs. Um, we've seen the firms like Goldman Sachs and American Century that have an ETF presence are, are, are likely to do non-transparent ETFs as well. I think the interesting thing that we're going to see in the next couple of years is whether or not some of these large firms, in the example of T. Rowe, the firm has no debt on its balance sheet, um, whether they tiptoe into the marketplace and gradually roll out um, an ETF of their own creation or whether they go into the marketplace and acquire an existing ETF provider. And I think that can also be true for some of the other somewhat late to the market entrants like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. I mean, we've seen JP Morgan rise to the top tier. Goldman isn't there yet. I think it's going to be interesting to see what they decide to do strategically. Yeah, agreed. So uh, thank you for that, uh, Anakit and, and Kathy, for answering the questions that came in. Uh, thanks to folks that have been submitting them. Apologies, but in the interest of time, we'll follow up with you directly. Uh, and if you have questions and you still have questions, please submit them. Uh, and as we move to the next slide, just to close things out, uh, we, we didn't go through in depth all the research, resources that we at CFRA make available tied to our stocks and our ETFs and our mutual fund research, but I'm laying out some of these on the screen, and you can see screenshots of that from thematic commentary to a newsletter that's become increasingly popular with our clients. So if you'd like to get uh, an email newsletter on a weekly basis that includes our ETF thematic content, our investment strategy, <coughs> and stock research thematic commentary uh, and other thought leadership, please let us know.
Uh, and we have, we've been doing a series of webinars, and this is an upcoming one that's taking place, not specific to ETFs, uh, but specific to the housing market that will be taking place in early November. Uh, we welcome you to participate in this. I'm excited about this because this is showing our global capabilities. So we'll have a U.S.-based and a internationally based analyst talking about the housing outlook on a global basis. You can register directly on our website uh, at our webinar page, and you'll also receive in the follow-up uh, from us thanking you uh, for attending the webinar. In addition to getting the slide deck, you'll also be prompted to register for the next webinar that we have coming up. And with that, I want to thank, uh, thank you on behalf of Anakit and Kathy and all of us at CFRA, our marketing and sales team that helped to put this together, and I appreciate their efforts. Uh, we'd appreciate there'll be a survey that'll pop up in a moment. We'd appreciate your feedback. Let us know what you think, including whether or not the technical difficulties took too long to solve. Thanks a lot and have a great day.